It has been over a decade since the release of Final Fantasy XV. Now, in 2023, Square Enix has finally released the next installment to the mainline series of Final Fantasy games, Final Fantasy XVI. This game breaks convention from the previous Final Fantasy games, making it more focused on action combat. A unique thing about the game is how it uses its summons. Summons are magical creatures that you can call upon to aid you in battle. These beasts are present in almost every Final Fantasy game, with their design evolving with each and every installment. And in Final Fantasy XVI, instead of you summoning this beast, you become them, resulting in large-scale kaiju versus kaiju battle. Shiva, Titan, Garuda, Ramu, Ifrit, Phoenix, Bahamut, and Odin. The game is also known for its darker than usual tones that uses very sensitive themes like slavery, child labor, climate change, and outright genocide. But to get into the game more, let's start with the story. Valestia, a land blessed with the gift of magic given by the Mother Crystals. These crystals come in variant shapes, sizes, and are spread throughout Valestia. Six factions struggle for control. The Holy Empire of Saint Brett, the Delmechian Republic, the Iron Kingdom, the Crystalline Dominion, the Kingdom of Walud, and the Grand Duchy of Rosaria. You play as Clive Rossfield, the firstborn of Archduke Elwin and Annabella Rossfield. Clive is the first shield of Rosaria and protector of his younger brother, Joshua, the dominant of the Phoenix, the Warden of Fire. Dominants are people chosen by the Akons to host their powers. So think of the Jinjirikis from Naruto or the Shifters from Attack on Titan. One night, as Rosaria was preparing to go to war with the Iron Kingdom, they were ambushed by the Holy Empire of Senbrek, leading to the death of Joshua by a mysterious Dark Akon. Clive, being the only survivor, is taken by the Empire and branded as a bearer. How is this important? You see, regular people can only use magic through a crystal. These pocket-sized crystals are mined straight from the Mother Crystals and used as a commodity. Sparking fires for warmth, generating water in wells, and even preserving food by freezing. Since bears don't require any of the crystals to use magic, they are treated as different, often detested, segregated, and even enslaved. Which means Clive, being able to use the Phoenix's power provided by Joshua, is given the same treatment and made an unwilling soldier for the Empire. Thirteen years later, Clive is sent on a suicide mission to eliminate the dominant of Shiva, which turns out to be his childhood friend, Jill Warwick, who was captured by the Iron Kingdom and was forced to become their weapon. Clive defects and attempts to rescue Jill, eventually being surrounded by the Iron Kingdom, only to be rescued by Torgal, Clive's wolf companion when he was young, and the dominant of Ramu, the Warden of Lightning, Sid. Not that Sid. Not that one either. Okay. Sid's name has been used in almost every mainline Final Fantasy game, except Final Fantasy 1. Sidolfus Telemon, the former Lord Commander of the Kingdom of Wudu, he offers Clive, Jill, and Torgul safety in return for help in achieving his goal. He has had enough of the world's treatment of bearers and aims to create the world of equality, where a bearer can die in his own terms. Clive says he just can't help yet as he needs to find his brother's killer. They reach a compromise as Sid offers to help Clive as there were recent sightings of another dominant who might be the one that Clive was looking for. Following the breadcrumbs led them face to face with Benedicta Harmon, the dominant of Garuda, the Warden of Wind. Which ends up Clive stealing some of Garuda's power and transforming into Ifrit, the Aiken of Fire, and the very being that killed his brother. Challenged by this fact, he decides to travel back to where it all began, to where he killed Joshua. 
Together with Jill and Torgal, they find a mysterious underground passage which leads them to a chamber where Clive is subjected to a trial where he will need to face himself and get L3 and R3 to accept the truth. Clive, now fully committed, joins Sid in his battle to create a world of equality. But there's just one problem to that goal, the blight, the very corruption that plagues the land. It is theorized that the Mother Crystals themselves are responsible. Clive, Sid, and the others set out to the Holy Empire of Sandbrek to find the truth. After destroying the Mother Crystal, a void opens and a dark figure steps out, reaching out for Clive. Sid ends up sacrificing himself to protect Clive, and Joshua, who we thought was dead, shows up to push back the monster and save Clive, Jill, and Torgal. Another five years pass. Another time skip. We find Clive, now taking up Sid's name, to continue his goal. Clive now needs to find a way to destroy the remaining Mother Crystals, eventually facing the other dominants, Hugo Kupka, the dominant of Titan, the Warden of Earth, Dion Lesange, the dominant of Bahamut, the Warden of Light, and the dominant of Odin, the Warden of the Dark. Barnabas, Tham, Tham, Thammer, Tharmer. Hey Google, how do you pronounce this? Tharmer. As well as Ultima, the god who was pulling the strings from the shadows. I'm not going to go more into it because I believe there's a limit to how spoilery spoilers can spoil. What I didn't like about the story is how drawn out and confusing it is. In fact, an article by Kotaku states that not even the developers can follow the game's story. And every now and then, or maybe most of the time, we get cutscenes. Sometimes we get some action sequences, but a lot of these times are just dialogue after dialogue after. Also, the amount of generic side quests are exhausting that I found myself putting down the controller and just stepping out. I could just leave the quest for later, but no. These quests are tied to a specific time in the main story, so if you happen to progress the main story without completing the side quest, they get by because they're gone. As said, combat is more focused on the hack and slash action, changing it up from the Press X simulator that was Final Fantasy XV or Final Fantasy VII Remake's ATB system. You have a skill tree that grants you access to the Acon abilities. You can only use three Acons at a time, but mastering or leveling up abilities will allow you to use them with others, mixing and matching, like using the Titan skills when you have the Phoenix icon selected, and vice versa. You unlock the capabilities to use the Acons as you progress the story and acquire them from their respective dominance. Some abilities have special effects, like deflecting fireballs, precise parry counters, or in case of the Odin abilities, use attacks to charge a meter, then unleashing a devastating attack when full. Finding the right combination of these flashy moves result in cool combos. Abilities have two ratings, damage and stagger. Enemies have a stagger meter, which is a couple of bars you can deplete by attacking. Exhausting them staggers them for a short while, while using up the second stuns them for a longer period of time, making them available to unleash your full arsenal of abilities. The Limit Break mechanic also gives Clive an alternate moveset and increased damage. Aegon fights are fun. The marvelous kaiju level battles are a sight to behold. There are also weapons and gears that you can equip Clive with. Some you can exchange for Zenny, which is the game's currency. Some of them you can upgrade by using materials that you find from fighting monsters, doing quests, or just laying there in the open world. There are also special materials, which you can get by hunting unique and more dangerous types of monsters. There's a notice board available where a Moogle, also available in other Final Fantasy games, gives you information on where to hunt these unique monsters. However, there are some problems. Party system, which was available in every mainline Final Fantasy game, has now been completely removed. You get companions from time to time, but they're utterly unnecessary. In fact, the only party member that you can technically control is Torgal, and by this point, you're probably too busy chaining combos to even do it. 
Every Akon represents an element, but because of combat now preferring flashy combos over strategy, element typing advantages or weaknesses are completely thrown out the window. Fire no longer beats ice, lightning no longer beats water, light no longer affects dark. Weapons and gears are also oversimplified. Upgrading your weapon seems too easy with them being available fairly quickly, as you won't have any shortage of materials. Accessories are also bland. You get 3 accessory slots, but most of them offer just specific minimal buffs to one ability. Some are very miscellaneous, giving you automatic dodge, potion heals, or torgal commands. Waste of an accessory slot. The only accessory that I really find useful is the Berserk Ring, which renders the Limit Break completely useless. Normally, the perfect time to go full Berserk is when enemies are down. Sure, you get to deal more damage, but when you activate Limit Break, enemies start to recover faster. What's the point? Just better to get the Berserk Ring accessory, which gives you a short Limit Break after a perfectly timed dodge. The Akon battles are both a hit and a miss, as some action sequences are just compact into a lot of quick time events. The world of Velestia is filled with gorgeous environments, incredible towns, and beautiful people. The same, however, cannot be said about the poor level design. The game may not be fully open world, but it has smaller, compact areas depending on the faction, from the swampy marshlands of Rosaria to the sandy deserts of Dalmechia and the open fields of Sunbrek. The world is filled to the brim with detail. However, areas are spread too far, which makes it a hassle going from one objective to the next. Open fields are also barren with only the occasional group of enemies. There is also an issue with the people. A lot of them are non-interactable and just spit out the same dialogue, making them feel more like background decoration more than people. The game also struggles in both performance and graphics mode. This might have something to do with ray tracing being active on both modes. Some PS5 users also reported some issues with their consoles overheating. The game's music also does a great job to relay the ambience. There are a couple of songs that I like that I saved in the playlist in Spotify. To be specific, Find the Flame and To Sail Forbidden Seas. Too bad I can't add them to the video because of Square Enix's strict music licensing rules. The game as a whole looks good, plays good, and has an alright story. One problem I had is with the Odin boss fight. There was a lot of build up for that battle, only to have something disappointing. They didn't even do the giant Akon fight right, that were present in the Garuda, Titan, and Bahamut fights. These fights, in my opinion, were way better. With Titan growing to the size of a mountain and fighting Bahamut in space, the game was heavily marketed using these Akon battles. Why didn't they use them? You don't even get to fight Shiva or Ramu. And we never find out what happened to Leviathan. Playing Final Fantasy has been a wild ride. It's a beautiful world filled with amazing action-packed combat. However, it gets bogged down by a long drawn-out story hashed together world design, and the fading promise of tons of giant monster combat lacking. By now, the question is, is Final Fantasy XVI an RPG? According to Wikipedia, a role-playing game is a game in which players assume the role of characters in a fictional setting. Players take responsibility for acting out these roles within the narrative. The game does have choices, but none of them really matter. In fact, no mainline Final Fantasy game has ever had any relevant choices which makes it a mess as it is. Wikipedia's meaning is more in line with what Western RPGs are, where the majority of choices you have actually affect the world, resulting in multiple endings. Final Fantasy games actually fall under the subcategory which is JRPGs, a traditional genre of RPG generally understood as involving a predetermined story and player characters, with an emphasis on narrative and storytelling instead of player choice. So in the end, my opinion is Final Fantasy XVI, along with its previous iterations, are RPGs. We just need to find a clear distinction between WRPGs and JRPGs. So if you liked the video, leave a like, comment down below on your take on the new Final Fantasy game. I know I'm giving a very crucial opinion, a lot of you may dislike the video, but it's fine, it's my opinion. I know Final Fantasy XVI is not going to be my game of the year, it might be yours. And stay tuned for more content, I guess. Bye.